Hi everyone, this is GKCS. In this video, we'll be talking about application programmable interfaces or in short APIs. The key word here in this full form is interfaces. The easiest way to think of this is functions. You have a return type, you have the method name itself, and you have the arguments that you're going to pass into this function. You can code in Golang, Python in the backend, and you can code in JavaScript and ASP on the front end, and still it'll work. The best examples of APIs that I have found is actually from the Indian government. So you have contracts, literally documents, PDF files written by the government, mentioning exactly what you're going to get as a response if you hit their systems. So how do APIs fit in the larger scheme of things? Well, firstly, you have somebody who's going to call this API, this green desktop over here, which has loaded a web page. Uh, the web page is, let's say, interviewer.io, and you click a button. The moment you do that, that's an action which requires some sort of data. So the code running on your mobile device, on your web page, is going to use JavaScript to create a request object and send it across the wire. The gateway then looks at what API has been called by this request. I mean, where is this request to be routed? We have spoken about this in the previous video of API gateways. You can expose APIs using REST or GraphQL. Uh, both have their pros and cons. GraphQL is a little more popular these days because it just sends you the data that you need to get and you also need to just send the data that you want to change. So that's pretty good. Uh, REST has some other benefits like HTTP caching. So you might want to use that also. Similarly, you might have external systems which you want to connect to. So if a payment has been made to PayPal, then I want to know when the payment was completed and what was the amount, and, you know, for what reason. So this is done using webhooks, which are very similar to APIs, uh, but you subscribe to webhooks. Okay, the benefit of this is that you don't need to keep pinging PayPal saying that, you know, do you get any payment? Did you get any payment? It's not polling it. You're going to get the response when there is a response. So what makes a good API? Here's a checklist that you can use to just go through your APIs and clear your code reviews with flying colors. The first thing is atomicity. Atomicity means that you do an operation either entirely or don't do it at all. So if you're loading, let's say, a value to cache. So you go to the database, get that value, put it in the front of the queue if it's a LRU cache, and then send a response. If any of this fails in between, then everything should fall back. So when you got the value from the database, and you were not able to put it in the front of the queue, maybe don't give back a response, okay? Um, the reason I'm saying this, for cache, it's not that important, but for some operations, you have multiple things happening together, and you want either all of them to go ahead or none of them to happen. It's easy to debug such operations. The second thing is item potency. Item potency means that if you make the same request multiple times to the same system, the operation is performed just once, okay? Important to notice that if I say add 10 rupees to my balance, and then I say add 10 rupees more, it, that doesn't mean that it won't go to 20, that'll go to 20. But if I give a ID of 50, okay? ID 50, add 10 rupees to my balance, then I send the same request with ID 50. The server knows that I have already passed this request, I have already done something with this request, so I don't need to pass it again. I can ignore all the operations that are to be done and give back a response saying it's a success. I had done this earlier. The third thing is errors. Errors are extremely important. Uh, in fact, they define the uh, adoptability of API. Like people are not going to use your API unless they feel like the errors are clear. So clear error codes, 200 means that everything is good. Anything in the 200 range, 200 to 299. Uh, anything between 400 to 499 means that something went wrong and it's probably a permission issue or it's an issue on your side. I couldn't find the object. Uh, anything above 500 probably means that the server messed up. Maybe the service is down, uh, it's unavailable. So that's the basic ranges. These are common HTTP codes uh, that you would be wise to adopt in your own APIs. Uh, the second thing is if you're sending back error responses, please make them human readable. One of the things that happens is you have this error and then you have all of the application stack printed out for the client to see. That's firstly a security issue, but the second thing is the client doesn't know what went wrong. I mean, did I send a null object somewhere? Now I have to run through my logs and check. It's much easier if you just tell them exactly what went wrong, okay? Uh, and this is one step ahead. You can have not just descriptive, but prescriptive error messages. And hey, your uh, username is too short. We can't allow that in the system. Instead of saying, 
username not allowed. What does that mean? You tell them what they need to do to get the thing done correctly. Uh, this is especially useful if you have B2B communications, businesses are communicating with you, which are, they're going to open their logs and they're going to check the responses of your API, right? Uh, they don't have a UI to play with. They, they literally depend on your error messages. That's the only thing that they can see. The, some of the other things that you can do to make your APIs smooth is uh, use the open API specs. These are really good. Uh, using Swagger uh, usually does this automatically. A Swagger will also generate the documentation around the API, like the basic documentation around it for you. And if you need to test an API, you can use curl or postman. Postman has this nice wrapper, uh, which is better than curl in my opinion. Of course, uh, postman is a full fledged GUI so that you can test your APIs. Now here's a war story, which is a true story. And unfortunately this happened when we were using a third party application to connect with Aadhaar, the system that I just praised. So this third party application sucked to put it simply. It was a B2B application in which case engineers are expecting your error messages and your API responses to be correct. Okay. To be according to the contract that you have mentioned. Unfortunately, uh, people were writing success sometimes with a capital S, sometimes with a small s, sometimes in all caps. So our backend was breaking because the string matching eventually had to be that match equals ignore case. So that was same. The other thing, which was, I think much worse was that we were getting responses with 200. So HTTP 200 means that everything is fine. And the response was error username not found. If it's 200, the application will think that things are fine. The client libraries, which send HTTP requests, get back responses and take that as a completed future. As a, you know, like a, if you have a promise in JavaScript, then that has successfully completed. And these guys are going to send an error response in that. So whenever you're sending responses, please use the codes correctly. The codes are extremely, extremely useful because uh, the other person's application might be depending on your error code not on the message that you have. Finally, when we integrated the system, we realized that the bytes being sent to this third party uh, were being sent over the wire. So this is Aadhaar information. So that's pretty confidential. You can think of it as social security, right? Uh, you have your biometrics being sent without encryption. So we did that. We had to talk with them. Uh, this is a person to person thing. It's not really that you write your contract. But uh, whenever you're reading the documentation, you should check what they're expecting. And if the expectation is weird and is not good for the users that you have on the other side, do bring it up. Do let them know that in the documentation itself, in the API itself, I can see problems. Forget about your internal implementation. So that's all I have for today. I hope you write some good APIs. I hope you test them well. And I hope you have the documentation written well so that the front-end engineers and other clients who are using your APIs are super happy with the documentation and testing. Uh, and if they're not, then well, you can tell them I'm working on it. Until next time, see you. Bye-bye.